microscopic clues in our DNA link every man on Earth back to one man, one common ancestor. To understand how this could be, we must discover scientific Adam's lost Eden. Enter his world and look him in the eye at an unexpected crossroads of Bible and biology. We're headed on a search for Adam. So different, the idea that we're all related seems impossible. It's hard to believe that six billion people all share the same ancestor. Yet three of the world's great religions, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, believe in one man who fathered us all. That makes Adam a key figure in the beliefs of more than half the world. Now, science offers a chance to find a genetic Adam. A single ancestor whose DNA survives in every man on Earth today. From the Inuit of the Arctic, to the Amerindians of the Amazon, from the nomads of the desert, to the businessmen of Wall Street. Spencer Wells, a geneticist with National Geographic, will lead us on a journey to identify the scientific Adam and reveal what made him so exceptional that he could father all men on Earth. But how do you unravel a chain so many generations long? chain that leads all the way to the roots of humanity's family tree. I really need a tool, a kind of time machine to allow me to do that, a genetic time machine. Geneticists have developed just such a tool, a way to follow DNA trails deep into the past. Our search for Adam will uncover genetic secrets of an unexpected cast of characters. One of the greatest warriors in history. One of America's founding fathers. Even an Ethiopian prince who claims to be descended from an ancient biblical king. What links these men to scientific Adam? Their DNA. Most of our DNA is a jumble from all our ancestors. It's what makes each of us unique. There's a section of our genetic code that stays almost constant. The Y chromosome, the special piece of DNA that only men have. It's passed virtually unchanged from father to son, like a family name. The Y chromosome links the men of today with the men who lived in the past. This tiny piece of DNA allows us to travel back in time through humanity's history. These days, we use DNA to test whether a man is the biological father of a child. Could it really link the billions of men alive today back to one ancestor? Wells believes the answer is yes. That the Y chromosome can trace the origins of men from all over the world. From Africa to America, all the branches on the tree join up in one trunk. The Y chromosome links men today back to their common ancestors. The key is to reveal super ancestors, men who left their genetic imprint on huge numbers. They're like branching points, where vast sections of the tree come together in a single man. Geneticists can trace them further and further back down the tree to the ultimate super ancestor, 
Scientific Adam. Our search starts in an unlikely place. With a super ancestor who passed his DNA to millions. He left such a vast legacy, Wells thinks he can trace it in a bar in San Francisco. The Bayview Boat Club is a watering hole for a group of Mongolian immigrants. These men have an outrageous claim. They think they're descendant from the great Mongol emperor, Genghis Khan. So how many people in Mongolia really believe that they're related to Genghis Khan? Every single person in the country. Every single person. There, there are, what, 10 million people living in the It seems preposterous, as if everyone in America believed they were descended from George Washington. But if there's any truth to their claim, these men will link back to a common ancestor who lived generations ago. The first step on our journey back toward Adam. So are you guys interested in finding out if uh, you could be related to Genghis Khan himself? Yeah, yeah let's go. Okay, and then uh, I'll pass... Tapping the, the power of DNA starts with a person. basic tool. They're sterile, by the way, which is kind of like a glorified toothbrush. Pull it out of the container. Looks like that. Just, Just a few it. cheek it's cells, right. and Wells can unlock okay. secrets from our genetic past. The end, with a simple it. swipe... Wells hopes to trace these men all the way back to a famous warrior who lived 800 years ago and thousands of miles away. Genghis Khan is one of the greatest historical figures of all time. Eight centuries ago, he ruled one of the largest empires the world has ever seen. What are the chances that a couple of guys in a San Francisco bar could be related to such an extraordinary man? Machines analyze the Mongolian's DNA, looking for traces on the Y chromosome that could link them to Genghis Khan. The odds against finding a connection seem astronomical. But Wells has some surprising news. I've got the results. He's found evidence that two of these men are related to Genghis Khan. These are your results. Saren Dorj Demberau. And Batur Tumar. All right. What makes Wells think that these men link back to Genghis Khan himself? He's never met them before. He doesn't have their family trees. And he doesn't have Genghis Khan's DNA. But Wells believes the Y chromosome can confirm the link. Most of the time, the Y chromosome is passed unchanged from father to son, like a last name. But sometimes little differences creep in like the spelling of a family name changing over time. Every so often, a harmless mutation appears on one man's Y chromosome. All his sons inherit that mutation. And all their sons. It marks all descendants like a brand. That's how Wells found that 16 million men are cousins. Their Y chromosomes all show the same mutations. That means they're all descended from one single man, a Central Asian super ancestor. But who was he? Wells and other genetic detectives piece together the clues. The mutations cluster around one place, Mongolia. They trace to almost a thousand years ago. Scientists believe he must have been a man of power who had many sons to pass on his family line. The clues all point to one man, Genghis Khan. The evidence is circumstantial, but compelling. Khan's empire stretched from Kazakhstan to Korea. He ruled a dynasty that lasted generations. 
His sons and their sons had the power and position to spread his Y chromosome. As his army swept through Central Asia, they cut down their enemies and often, it said, took their women. The result? More offspring with Genghis Khan's Y chromosome and other men's lineages destroyed forever. Genghis Khan's DNA is buried with him in an unknown grave, but his Y chromosome mutations survive in his descendants today. The research shows the Y chromosome can take us back hundreds of years. But to find scientific Adam, we must trace a man from our very beginning who fathered not millions, but billions. The payoff is almost unimaginable. An Adam who may have been the first truly modern human whose Eden we can pinpoint, whose face we can reconstruct. This is a scientific quest, yet the idea behind our search was first written down in a document of faith, the Bible. Thousands of years before genetics, the book of Genesis tells of one man who fathered us all. The Bible gives no physical description of Adam, saying only that he's created out of dust in God's image. Adam's rib provides the raw material for the first woman, Eve. God gives them a home, the Garden of Eden. But soon, tempted by a serpent, Adam and Eve eat from the Tree of Knowledge and are cast out of paradise. Adam and Eve have children, and according to the Bible, this one family has grown to include everyone on Earth today. The New Testament's Gospel of Luke lays out Adam's family tree, generation by generation. But what if we tested someone today who claims to be linked to that lineage? Most of the people the Bible places on Adam's family tree have disappeared without a trace. Yet one stands out as a significant historical figure, Solomon, the third king of Israel. Even today, there are people who claim to be directly descended from Solomon, the Ethiopian royal family. It seems far-fetched. The Jerusalem of Solomon is 1,500 miles from Ethiopia. But the Ethiopians claim to have an extraordinary piece of physical evidence that ties them to the Holy Land. The Ark of the Covenant was believed to contain the tablets of the Ten Commandments, the Word of God. Legend says it was kept in a temple built by Solomon in Jerusalem. Until it was taken by Solomon's son, Menelik, and later brought to a little church in Aksum in northern Ethiopia. Today, the Ethiopian royal family claims direct descent from Menelik, and so from Solomon. If that's true, their family tree connects directly to the biblical lineage of Adam. To test that lineage, we'll need a royal who'll cooperate. In 1974, Ethiopia's emperor Haile Selassie was deposed. The royal family fled into exile. We tracked down a prince who agreed to participate in our search on one condition. We can't reveal his identity. He wants to avoid accusations that he's using his link to Solomon to reclaim the throne. The prince takes a secret DNA test. A few tiny cheek cells transport us deep into the past. The DNA can reveal where the prince's ancestors came from. Could it link him to Solomon? 
The results are tantalizing. The prince's Y chromosome mutations do lend support to his claim. They point to Middle Eastern ancestry, but it's not definitive proof. With Genghis Khan, we had 16 million men pointing to one man. With Solomon, we may have one Ethiopian prince. There's simply not enough evidence to go on. The experiment shows how hard it can be to trace the Bible's genealogy. It's a book of faith, not forensic evidence. What the Bible is saying about creation is way beyond the scope of science. It's not about DNA and all that, it's about who we are as people. In Hebrew, the name Adam also means people. What's important about Adam is that Adam is every person. The Bible gave us the idea of Adam. But finding the scientific version will take modern genetics. If we succeed, we'll link all men today back to a scientific Adam. And maybe even pinpoint his Garden of Eden. As people move from place to place, they often end up far from where their lineage began. Our family tree is becoming tangled at the top. Tracing family lines is getting harder and harder. There's only one way to clear away the tangles. Analyze Y chromosomes from people who still live in the land of their forefathers. To get a clearer picture of our family tree, Wells is leading a research project with the National Geographic Society and IBM. It's called the Genographic Project. It's a massive undertaking. It will take years. But when he's done, Wells will be able to tell where anyone in the world comes from. Wells and his colleagues have crisscrossed the globe in search of DNA samples. From Aborigines in Australia to tribesmen in South America. They've journeyed from Central Asia to South Africa to Siberia. Wells can already tell a lot about someone's origins just using their Y chromosome. And he thinks he's found something unexpected in the background of one of America's most famous figures. The third president, Thomas Jefferson. Research on Jefferson's why has already given us one huge surprise. It had long been suspected that Jefferson fathered children by his slave, Sally Hemings. A 1998 study used the Y chromosome to prove that it was almost certainly true. It showed that this white man apparently had black descendants. Now, Wells believes he's discovered something about Jefferson that no one suspected. A discovery not about his descendants, but about his ancestors. And it could take us a big step toward Adam. Wells noticed that Jefferson's Y chromosome mutations don't look European. So where did Jefferson's ancestors come from? To find out the truth, Wells needs another DNA sample. The trail leads to rural Virginia. One of the closest living relatives of the founding father lives in Freeze, Virginia. Now, do you have any any sense of, of your own ancestry and who you're descended from? I'm Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson. How many? Odin Jefferson you know? shares the founding father's last name. Yeah. He also inherited his Y chromosome. It's not going to hurt, and you rub it on the inside of your cheek. Really scrape away up and down. Everything about Jefferson points to him being European. Genealogists have traced his ancestry back to medieval France and Britain. But the test reveals something you might never have imagined. Jefferson's Y chromosome links him not to Europe, but to the Middle East. East, what is now Lebanon and Syria. This is the best guess. A direct ancestor 
lived in a land that no longer exists, called Phoenicia. The Bible calls it Canaan. Jefferson may look European, but his Y chromosome tells a different story. It shows that what we look like may not really tell us where we come from. And it raises a question mark over the traditional image of Adam. For centuries, artists have depicted him like this, like a European. For many of us, this is Adam. Michelangelo's famous painting in the Vatican Sistine Chapel. He looks like a beautiful Italian who spends a lot of time in the gym. Did the common ancestor of all men really look like this? The story of Jefferson suggests he could have looked very different. But Jefferson can lead us much further back than his Phoenician ancestor. Jefferson has a particular mutation that he shares with men from many different countries. With the same techniques used on Genghis Khan, Wells can link this mutation to another critical common ancestor. He's known as M9. He lived around 40,000 years ago. Wells' research suggests this one man could be the forefather of half of all men alive. We're getting closer to Adam. But Wells knows there are some men who do not have the M9 mutation. To identify the common ancestor of all men, he must take us deeper down the tree. But where does he go next? There are clues from beyond the world of genetics. It's evidence you can touch. Evidence from bones. Before the powerful new tools of DNA, our picture of humanity's past came almost entirely from fossils. But that picture is incomplete. The oldest human fossils come from Africa, dating back millions of years. But ancient remains have been found at other sites far away. The Middle East has produced early human fossils. And pre-human remains have been found in Asia. Fossil evidence points to three regions that could be the birthplace of humankind. Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. Can DNA resolve which one gave birth to scientific atom? Wells wants to find a place where people from all three regions intersect. A study of historical trading routes offers a likely candidate. Off the coast of Kenya, the tiny island of Pate. A mysterious place, with clues that seem out of place in Africa. Curious ruins. It's the main mosque. It was painted black. I still see it. Monuments that might be Islamic. Tombs that look almost Chinese. Even the faces suggest an intriguing mix. Some have the lighter skin tone of Europeans. Some could be Arabs. Others have eyes that look Asian. For centuries, traders have come here from all over the old world. From Europe, the Middle East, maybe even from China. Jumbo. 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 <laughs> History has created a genetic melting pot. And by taking a sample of your DNA, of your genes, we can say something about the people you're related to in the past, your ancestors. If the Y chromosomes here lead to a common ancestor for all these ethnic groups, they could lead us to Adam. If you could open your mouth. Wells takes samples from 25 local men. Right. Thank you. Okay. Scientific Adam. Wells believes he was born around 60,000 years ago. 
It sounds ancient. But it means our search for a common ancestor has not led us all the way back to a time of ape men. Or even to primitive beings like Homo erectus. Compared to the billions of years of human evolution, we found Adam in the recent past. The critical discoveries of where and when Adam lived prove he could not have looked like this. For the first time, it's possible to paint a new portrait of Adam based on science. Facial reconstructions have shown what other ancient humans might have looked like. We have images of earlier beings like Homo erectus and the ancient prehuman known as Lucy. These faces are all based on fossil skulls, but there are no intact skulls from Adam's time. There is a man who can give a face to Adam, even without his skull. Frank Bender calls himself the recomposer of the decomposed. He's a forensic artist, a specialist at bringing the dead to life. Bender works regularly for police departments around the world, giving faces to human remains, even when the skulls are almost missing. Adam's skull is missing, but Bender will base his reconstruction on the closest skull he can find, and that brings him to the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. Gary Sawyer is an expert on reconstructing prehistoric faces. He believes this skull, found at a site called Kafsa, is a good basis for Adam. Because he combines modern features with still some uh, archaic features in a lower forehead or frontal and good sized brow ridges. The Kafsa skull is about 100,000 years old. Adam's skull would be much more modern. Bender will have to estimate what thousands of years of evolution would have done to Kavza man's appearance. First, he uses his forensic skills to figure out what Kavza man looked like. Wow, that came out. That must blue perfect. Bender can determine his features from the structure of his skull. The shape of the cheekbones. The line of the jaw the width of the nose, the size of the chin. Kavza man is 100,000 years old. To construct a face for Adam, Bender has to update this portrait by 40,000 years. As humans evolved, the shape of our skulls changed, brow ridges shrank, the forehead became more vertical, the chin more prominent. Adam should be almost halfway between this ancient man and humans like us. Bender needs to find that midpoint. He needs a modern face to compare to the ancient skull. But not just any face. He wants someone whose lineage traces most directly back to Adam. Wells knows where to look. In East Africa is a little known tribe called the Hadzabe. Spencer, Dano. Their DNA links them almost straight back to Adam. They give us a glimpse into his world. And they point to what Adam could have looked like. Scientific Adam should be a midpoint between the ancient Kafsa face and one of these faces. Like the Hadza chief Julius Hendaya Ne Ume. But how do you blend the two? To do this accurately, Bender turns to technology developed for security applications like anti terrorism.
Facial recognition software measures the incremental differences that make a face unique. Like the distance between the eyes, the width of the nose. Engineers pick out over 200 features that together define the shape of the cops of face, turning it into a mathematical model. They do the same with the Hadzabe chief. The computer compares the two sets of data, faces separated by 100,000 years, and generates the midpoint, a blueprint of Adam. A printer converts the computer model into a 3D head. Layer by paper thin layer, the head emerges. Bender will use this as a template to finally give Adam a face. But the Hadzabe can do more than show what scientific Adam might have looked like. They can give us a window into his world and they reveal clues to what made Adam and his descendants so exceptional. They could give rise to all men on Earth. <laughs> Mutations on the Y chromosome show that scientific Adam was born around 60,000 years ago. An extraordinary time in human history, a time of crisis. Scientists believe humans were on the brink of extinction. The entire population may have fallen to no more than a couple of thousand. But from this moment of peril, humans begin an astonishing rise. For the first time, art appears. Tools become much more advanced. This new energy and innovation enable our species to conquer the planet. Something critical had changed in human nature. What triggered it is a puzzle. Yet it seems to come just after Adam. Is it a coincidence? I don't know. Maybe it is. But it's also possible that Adam was the one who set in motion these changes. How could one man change his whole species? Wells has a theory. It's cutting edge and highly controversial. He believes Adam may have been the first man with the ability to think as we do. The first truly modern man. If Wells had his way, he'd go back in time to find out. The ancient Hadzabi tribe in Tanzania may offer the next best thing, a window into Adam's world. As people, the Hadzabi are as modern as any of us. But as a society, they've chosen to retain the lifestyle of the earliest modern humans, the lifestyle of Adam. The Hadzabe are hunter-gatherers. Survival in this environment is an extraordinary challenge. They rely on the kind of ingenuity that Wells believes could have originated with Adam himself. It could almost be Adam's clan preparing for the hunt. The Hadzabe have figured out a way to turn local trees into lethal weaponry. The bows are strong, but flexible. Fire straightens the arrow shafts. They look simple, but when they appeared, they were revolutionary. Weapons that kill at a distance. Deadly accurate. The Hadzabe set out, just as Adam and his sons may have done, to pit their weapons and their brains against their prey. Hadzabe's hunting techniques work, but they had to be invented, developed by someone. Someone with the insight to go beyond the techniques used by the people before. And Wells believes it may have been Adam himself who first showed this intelligence. A 
culture of innovation is one key to the success of our species. But what amplifies this genius is another unique skill, language. Wells believes Adam may have had a brand new ability to use complex speech. Astonishingly, the Hadzabe could show us how Adam spoke. What? 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 Tisha? Tisha? Bogo. Bogo. What? What? Simba. Simba, lion. They speak one of the most intricate languages on earth. Along with regular consonants, they use a chorus of clicks. Their speech is far more complicated than most modern languages, and that suggests it's been around for much longer. English has around 30 different sounds. Click languages can have over a hundred. <laughs> Scientists believe that when humans first began to speak, they may have used clicks like these. We could be listening to Adam himself. Like the bow and arrow, these sounds are simple. But they may point to what gave Adam his revolutionary intelligence. The Hadzabe have allowed us to explore Adam's world. Now Frank Bender can show us what he might have looked like. His goal is not just to sculpt Adam, but to reveal his personality. I tried to get into his head just like I would a fugitive. Intuition is the binder between art and science. It's the part that pulls it all together and gives it that life, that spark. I picture him very much alive and with a lot of the basic feelings that we have today. Confidence, one point, insecurity at another. Finally, Wells comes face to face with the man he's been searching for. A new portrait of the common ancestor of every man today. Adam. Without a skull, we can't know for sure what Adam looked like. But a combination of genetic evidence, Bender's forensic skills, and cutting-edge computer software suggest he looks something like this. Thousands of years after the Bible, and hundreds of years after Michelangelo, we have a whole new face for Adam. I like the expression. He's got a very forceful look. You know, he's intent on something, maybe taking over the world. You, know, you begin to get perhaps an insight into why these guys won out and why this guy's our ancestor. Science can't tell for sure what set Adam apart. There were other men who lived alongside him. But over the centuries, all the other men's lines died out. Maybe some had only daughters or no children at all. Their Y chromosomes were lost forever. Only Adam's lineage survives. Here's how Adam could have become our ultimate super ancestor. Sometime around 60,000 years ago, Adam is born. He's a fast learner, and in time, he proves himself as a leader of his tribe. His command of language sets him apart. Perhaps he invents new and more lethal weapons. Or takes charge of the hunts, devising new strategies. He's much better than the other guys at providing for his family and the tribe. And this makes him popular with the ladies. He has more children than the others. His sons inherit not just his smarts, but of course his Y chromosome. Like Genghis Khan and his sons, Adam's Y chromosome begins to spread through the population. 
and Adam's intelligence gives his sons the ability to leave Africa and populate the world. Around 50,000 years ago, we start to expand out of Africa. Some populations start to leave around that time, and very rapidly, they reach places as far afield as Australia, perhaps within a couple of thousand years. A couple of thousand years is like the blink of an eye. And Wells can trace it all back to one scientific atom. This is not the man God creates in the book of Genesis. But now, thousands of years after the Bible was written, science has confirmed the essence of its story. There was one man whose DNA survives in every man on earth today. His Garden of Eden was likely East Africa. Other humans came before him, but only after him did we become truly modern. Scientific Adam unites all men today. From Bono to Nelson Mandela. From Tiger Woods to David Beckham. From Osama Bin Laden to the Dalai Lama. Effectively, we're all members of an extended family. We're all really cousins. And some believe that's the message of Genesis, too. Adam represents all of us. And that's what makes him important. Not Adam individually, but the fact that Adam is every individual. We are all Adam. In finding scientific Adam, the Y chromosome has not just united all men. It has found common ground between the worlds of science and faith.